I'd like to welcome you to our second EGAD webinar. Uh, the Research Data Alliance Agricultural Data Interest Group, EGAD, enables coordination and progress among a community of international data experts. At the RDA plenary meeting 14 in October, we agreed to start a webinar series to enable high quality presentations and discussions to happen even if we cannot all be together in person at RDA. These webinars will help us keep up with cutting edge developments in agricultural data and will encourage the free flow of ideas. We hope to offer them about twice a month scheduled at two different times so that participants in all time zones can attend at least one of the two talks. All of the talks will be recorded and posted. Please stay tuned for more information on future talks and let us know if you would like to present your work to the group. After the presentation, please stay for a question and answer session with our speakers. And I would ask you during the presentation, please post your questions in the chat box in the lower right of your screen and I will read them out so they can be answered. Today's talk is entitled Mobilizing Capacity Development for Bridging the Digital Divide in Agriculture. Our speakers today are Fotini Zampati, who is a legal professional with the Association for Technology and Structures in Agriculture, KTBL. She holds an LLB in law and a master's in European Union and business law. She's been working as a data rights research specialist to support the GoDan initiative on ethical and legal aspects of open data. Dr. Suchith Anand is the chief scientist and advisor at GoDan, the global open data for agriculture and nutrition. Dr. Anand co-founded an initiative called geo for all with a vision to make geospatial education and digital economy opportunities accessible to all and to enable a better future for everyone. Please join us in uh, welcoming Puccini and Suchif uh, for their presentation. Please go ahead. Thank you very much uh, for, for inviting us. And it is on behalf of Godan, it is a great pleasure to uh, be here today and share our work, especially at, on today's topic on mobilizing capacity development for bridging the digital divide in agriculture. So I want to first introduce you all to uh, Godan. Uh, for those of you who are new to Godan, the Global Open Data for Agriculture and Nutrition is an initiative that seeks to support global efforts to make agriculture and nutritionally relevant data available, accessible, and usable for unrestricted use worldwide. Godan initiative focuses on building high-level policy and public and private institutional support for open data. And our focus is on zero hunger aim. And we believe open data will play a key role in helping us achieve this aim. And Open innovation is very important to help us achieve this. So that's why we are very keen to uh, build up the capacity, especially in developing countries, to make use of the open data to help help uh, achieve the aim of zero hunger for all. So I want to also uh, briefly mention why openness is so important. You know, uh, in Godan, our mission is on, for example, the sustainable development goals on the zero hunger aim, the uh, SDG two, but it links with a lot of other SDG aims as well. So you know, so there we see a clear connection for, for zero hunger with the other, uh, some of the other SDG aims. And uh, openness is very key because it helps us, uh, you know, for, for, for any of these SDG aims, you know, we, we find that openness is very important to help us achieve all of these uh, SDG aims. And we will sh go through some of these examples in the presentation. So as I mentioned before, you know, the zero hunger and no poverty, you know, for example, there's, uh, you know, the linkages are so, so linked, you know, so if you want to achieve zero hunger, you know, we have to address zero, uh, no poverty. And again, you know, the links with quality education, uh, you know, reduce inequalities, all these are so connected. So that's why the, we, we want to have this holistic view of how we address this as well. So I want to also touch on, you know, because our topic today is on capacity development and how we build synergies for it. Uh, and as we mentioned before, even today, you know, 800 million people are in a, every, in a, across the world, you know, with all these advances, are still suffering from uh, deliberating hunger and malnutrition, and this is unacceptable. So this means that one in every nine people, with majority being women and children, are suffering from hunger and malnutrition. And the solution we believe for zero hunger is is lies in of an unavailable agricultural and nutritional data. So what we want to do is now, to, uh, especially for the developing world, is to look at synergies, how we can build up capacity development 
uh, as an as a as an aim to uh, for he helping zero hunger for all. So I want to also address uh, the issue of how open data is going to help smallholder farmers. In the, mostly in developing countries, smallholder farmers are not only harnessing the power of data, but also must overcome challenges and risks to ensure that investment benefit them. And the, there are two main challenges that uh, smallholder farmers, especially in the developing world, need to overcome. First, they need to gain access to the relevant data and services provided by others. And second is to make sure that any data that they share does not actually weaken their positions. So improving data access in agriculture is not only a technical issue, it is also a social, ethical, and legal one. Having in mind, the world of agriculture is quite diverse, composed of very different types of agriculture methods and farming realities. So what we hope to do today in our webinar is to uh, go through some of these uh, issues as well. So capacity development, but also highlight some of the issues of especially facing smallholder farmers. So we want to start with uh, one of the key kind of stumbling blocks for, uh, for uh, especially in the developing world uh, to help us achieve this, and that is the digital divide. And this is a real, this is a unfortunately a sad reality in most of the developing world, where, uh, in a, uh, where uh, the even though you know internet is uh, uh, prevalent in most in the develop, uh, in the in the developed world in many parts of the developing world even getting access to internet is very uh, is not uh, uh, is not yet achieved you know and there are issues of uh, low bandwidth even in places where there is internet. You know, there is low bandwidth and so many other uh, issues. And my colleague, Fotini, I'm handing over to Fotini now, who will be able to uh, talk on this and share some of the uh, some of the experiences and uh, thoughts on this aspect. So, Fotini, I hand over to you. Yes, um, thank you, Suhith, and uh, thank you, Cynthia, for uh, the invitation today to be part of this um, RDA webinar uh, series. Uh, as Suhith um, mentioned, uh, we can't really uh, doubt the digital divide that uh, lies within uh, agriculture. So, uh, a first approach is to um, define what we are, uh, what do we mean by saying digital divide? So, digital divide is defined as the gap between individuals, households, uh, businesses, and uh, geographic areas at different socioeconomic levels with regard both to their uh, opportunities to access information and communication technologies and to their use of the internet for a wide variety of um, activities. Uh, this is a definition by OECD, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and uh, Development. And um, there are two aspects to the digital uh, divide. The first gap considers mainly the division between those who have access to ICT, such as computers and the internet, and those, of course, who do not. This type of scope often refers to the urban-rural divide, and the latter having slower um, internet speeds, prices, and technological uh, choice. The second gap refers to different types and levels of internet use, motivation, and skills, uh, meaning uh, looking at what uses and benefits people enjoy once they have access to the internet. This also includes looking at the type of context and services assessed online, um, for example, e-health and government, as well as whether these comply with international web accessibility standards to make their uh, content accessible to all, including people with disabilities uh, like uh, older people. So the issues around um, the digital uh, divide in agriculture that we need to take into uh, account uh, is uh, literacy, first of all, that um, many people are still incapable of basing uh, reading and uh, writing. Uh, there is the gender issue that women are 50% less likely to be online. There is also uh, poverty. Millions of people still live below the international poverty line. And uh, the lack of electricity is another barrier, especially in rural areas. Uh, also, affordability. The high cost of broadband access in uh, many countries is also an issue. 
the language, most online content is only in a handful of languages. Uh, the local content, lack of locally appealing apps hinders the usage. And of course, the network coverage, 3G networks reached in 2016, 7% of population, but was only 19% uh, in rural areas. Uh, so there are several dimensions to digital divide that uh, need to be addressed. Uh, first of all, how to strengthen the capacity to access and reuse of data, especially in countries with very low literacy levels and limited access and knowledge of digital technologies. Um, another point is how to improve the skills and training necessary for farmers to make use of the digital technologies. Um, also, how to foster a culture of innovation, especially in the development of local content, and how to overcome gender and other biases, mostly in many uh, developing countries. Uh, these are the most basic issues and um, some of uh, also uh, the basic key, uh, key challenges, uh, of course, is lack of awareness. Uh, farmers, for example, are not aware of their rights. They're not aware of the value of um, benefit sharing. Uh, there is lack of resources. There is lack of trust and transparency between the data sharing and exchange within agribusinesses and different stakeholders. There's the lack of institutional support and expertise. Also, there are legislation gaps uh, with one of the most basic challenges, I would say, uh, around data ownership and to be more um, concrete, I would say, um, better access and control of data uh, use. Uh, there are privacy and security issues. Uh, of course, I need to mention uh, that there is the general data protection regulation uh, about personal data in Europe, which was the basis for uh, other uh, legislation and regulation worldwide. And very, very recently, there is the regulation of free flow of non-personal data that uh, mentions that um, precision agriculture and data around precision agriculture is considered non-personal data. This is important because it opens some uh, um, doors uh, to um, address these challenges um, better. And uh, of course, um, within big players around, we need to uh, address the issue of the digital feudalism and the need to uh, reduce it and democratize information and um, address the questions on how information can bring about openness, accessibility, transparency, accountability, networking, and this can happen uh, only if different stakeholders engage uh, each other with an open uh, dialogue. And also, we need to shed light to, to not only to the digital divide, but also to uh, power uh, asymmetries within uh, the actors that have control over uh, data. So um, data is well known that uh, it is considered the new gold or the new oil. And uh, digital technologies um, contributed a lot to the transformation of the agricultural sector. It is well known. The benefits of data-driven services and products are well known, uh, but also uh, individual protection and control over uh, personal data is well known and needs to take in, into account. Uh, so in the agricultural sector, this means that farmers need to be able to control access to and use of data that concerns them, understand the value of data sharing, as I mentioned uh, earlier, and being reassured that trust this is the key word, that trust is built based on good data practices. In order to do so, uh, to see the issues as mentioned, it is necessary to raise some basic questions. Um, for example, what is ethical? What is practical? How can we protect privacy uh, by releasing data? How can we, in overall, navigate these trends to transform um, agriculture? These are basic questions, but still, I would say, um, quite difficult to, to respond. Um, uh, so the ethical issues about data governance and practice, as mentioned, is around privacy. What about personal data? Uh, um, what about farm data? Uh, which one of it is considered personal and non-personal data? 
what about data protection and security, what can we do in case of data breaches, um, what uh, is about transparency and trust, who is uh, responsible, uh, what agribusinesses are doing uh, with um, the collection and sharing of data. These are some of the basic concerns. Who owns data is also um, uh, a very uh, relevant question. Uh, and uh, what about consent? For example, do farmers are aware uh, when they are um, giving their data for what purposes is this collection or what types of data or for how long uh, they, uh, their data is going to be uh, stored. Uh, so many questions, um, many challenges I would say, but things are not, uh, are, are, are quite, let's say, um, optimistic, even the challenges. Uh, because, for example, currently uh, there are uh, worldwide uh, three uh, ag codes of contact that they address these issues and try to say, uh, set light to these concerns uh, about f farmers, farmers' rights, data governors. And um, the first one is the EU Code of Conduct on Agricultural Data Sharing by Contractual Agreement. And um, that means that the GDPR was actually uh, the basis uh, on, uh, on, on what the some agribusinesses, European agribusinesses, came together and um, uh, developed this code of conduct addressing um, uh, basic uh, key concepts like the concept of the data originator, for example, uh, meaning that um, uh, whoever um, creates data from his or her farm is the data originator. I need to highlight that um, they avoid to use the word uh, owner because it's more complex uh, definition of ownership, as mentioned earlier. Uh, they are dealing also with the uh, rights of data originator, right to information, uh, right to portability, to his data or her data to be transmitted from one data user to another, uh, need for a simple and understandable contracts, the need for plain language, because as we all know, uh, contracts are very, very complex, even for us, the, the lawyers. Uh, to, to explain, uh, let alone to, to farmers. They are also promoting the idea of, of absolute anonymization, reducing unfair amendments to contracts, and protecting a natural person's privacy, meaning that whenever it comes to personal data, then the GDPR applies. Uh, also, the USA, the privacy and security principles from uh, farm data um, are also um, around the same concepts as the EU Code of Conduct. They have developed uh, 13 principles. Also, uh, the basic one is farmers own the data created on, on, uh, on their farms. And uh, in order to, uh, for agribusinesses to comply with these uh, principles, uh, they need to answer to 10 simple questions uh, to be accredited, and there is an independent law firm by Tom Johnson uh, who evaluates uh, these questions that uh, any agribusiness uh, submit. And if uh, they are compliant, they get the Ag Data Transparent seal. There are currently around, I think, 30 uh, agribusinesses, among them uh, John Deere, that uh, have been accredited. And uh, last but not least, uh, there is the New Zealand Farm Data Code. Uh, also have developed uh, guidelines around data governance and um, um, also here uh, agribusinesses uh, need to show that they are compliant uh, around data governance principles, about, around privacy, and uh, they need to do a self-audit as a first step, as a second step, a statutory declaration that they comply with the principles, and uh, the last step is um, an assessment, and uh, if uh, everything uh, um, is okay and uh, they are compliant to these guidelines, uh, then an independent authority 
grants an annual uh, license and a certificate as well as a trademark uh, to use. So these codes cover central issues as mentioned, such as terminology, definition, data ownership, data rights, privacy issues, security, and they all attempt to harness the benefits of agricultural data while protecting producers' privacy and uh, security. Uh, we need to mention, uh, though, that these um, codes of conduct, they are not legally binding, uh, meaning that they rely on the goodwill between uh, the two uh, parties involved. But nevertheless, these codes are important because they build awareness around the importance of transparency and trust in agricultural data flows and um, changing the mindset of how um, agribusinesses view uh, data uh, and making data producers, primarily farmers, more aware of their rights. So um, in my mind, these codes of conduct are uh, very, very uh, important to, as a very good first uh, approach. But um, one key issue uh, is that needs to be mentioned is that the existing codes of conduct do not have farmers or farmers' organizations, let alone smallholder farmers, as their primary target audience, but rather the agribusinesses and ag tech companies that work with farmers and use their data. So it is important to have a customizable code of conduct that provides basic and general guidelines based on farmers' needs and interests uh, uh, for farmers' perspective. And um, at Gordon, we have established a subgroup of co on codes of conduct. And uh, in uh, July, uh, this July, we did a workshop uh, at Ketebel in uh, Darmstadt here in um, Germany, where uh, we uh, divided the participants to different stakeholders, uh, meaning we had um, a researcher's perspective, we had the government perspective, but of course, we were aiming more uh, uh, to farmers' perspective. So um, these are uh, this is the outcome of uh, the farmers' perspective, meaning what should a code of contact um, ha uh, has in order to protect, let's say, more uh, farmers. What is the hierarchy? What are their concerns? So what do farmers want to be included in these codes of conduct and then for uh, in, in, into the contract? And you can see first is um, data ownership, uh, then is terms and definitions, farmers' rights, farmers' advanced notification of data collection uh, through a clear briefing, um, farmers' informed consent, um, clear and understandable contract, contract termination, disclosure, use and sell, limitation, liability and protection of intellectual property rights, and last but not least, enforcement certification schemes and their effective implementation by, of course, an independent and participatory administrating um, entity. Uh, so. These are the issues, but these are some first uh, approaches uh, for um, having some tangible outcomes. And um, the question is, how can we all work together for capacity development in open data and agriculture? And Sui Heath will explain to you furthermore how this can be done and how we are doing this um, at Gordon. Sui Heath. Thank you very much, Fadini. Uh, so uh, what I will now do is uh, share with you some of the work we are doing in capacity development and how we have been uh, uh, working in capacity development and some of the uh, lessons to learn from our experiences. So for us, from the beginning, you know, we were very keen to uh, listen to our uh, to, uh, to the main uh, audience, uh, main stakeholders around the world, and especially in the developing world. So we have been running uh, like think tanks and hands-on workshops uh, to help us understand what the real needs of uh, uh, from, from from the user perspective is. And I want to show you one example of a think tank we ran at the Regional Center for Mapping and Resources Development based in Nairobi in uh, 2016, where we brought together uh, you know, colleagues from uh, the government agencies, uh, the uh, universities, academia, uh, industries to uh, look into areas of where they 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 need uh, you know they, they think it's important. And one of the key uh, lessons we learned was that 
open data on its own is not a benefit uh, benefit uh, you know if, if they don't have the uh, for example the 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 wider uh, like the open tools uh, to make use of the data for example so based on these lessons we have changed our uh, for, for example in godan we have a capacity urban booking group we have now made available uh, free and open tools uh, to uh, not only open data uh, open data uh, resources but also free and open tools uh, and uh, thanks to our uh, colleagues in godan action a lot of tutorials are also been made and available so i will share some of these experiences with you on on how we uh, uh, in in involved in the capacity development activities at godan so uh, the, the one of the key things we learned was it's uh, very important to not only have open data but also open software free and open software open uh, standards uh, for interoperability open access to research publications uh, and uh, are all vital uh, to help us achieve this so in in fact the whole open science philosophy and open science principles we find it very important especially in the developing countries if they are also uh, to be able to uh, make use of the, uh, be part of the digital economy you know that's what uh, it, that helps them uh, be part of it and in fact uh, you know in the earlier presentation by fortini she mentioned about the uh, issues on digital feudalization you know and these are the issues that we especially for you know for uh, for, for the developing world and uh, for the economically poor people this is very important to make sure you know they they also have the uh, uh, from digitally uh, they are also empowered to be uh, equal participants in the digital economy and in uh, agri agriculture uh, uh, economy as well. So that's what our capacity development programs have been focused on. And as I mentioned before, I wanted to, uh, there are some excellent examples that some of the Godan community has been doing, especially the Godan Action colleagues. Uh, and I want to highlight especially this, uh, one of the e-learning modules they have been developing. And for those of you who don't know about Godan Action, it was a uh, three and a half year program that was funded by the uh, UK's Department for International Development and led by the Wageningen Environmental Research uh, with a lot of partners, including uh, FAO, uh, uh, the GFAR, the Global Forum of Agriculture Research, Aid Data, Agrono, uh, Land Portal, the Institute of Development Studies, Open Data Institute, and CTA, the Technical Center for Agriculture and Rural Cooperation. So all these colleagues from all these uh, organizations worked for, to make this uh, curriculum. They developed a open data management in agriculture and nutrition curriculum and i will recommend those who uh, are interested in the whole open data in agriculture and want to learn more please uh, please go go to these uh, materials training materials which are all openly available if you go to the godan uh, capacity development website you'll be able to find the links to this curriculum and the materials so it basically covers five units you know one on open data principles uh, the second unit on how to how you can use open data and the third on for example, if you are a data producer, you know, how can you make op data open? So this covers, you know, a lot of aspects of how, how, how to uh, release open data and what are the uh, 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 things you need to know on that. And the unit four is specifically on exchange of op exchanging open data principles and interoperability. And again, open standards and all those aspects come into this uh, unit. And unit five is on intellectual property and copyright and uh, so licensing and all those aspects. So uh, for the, it, is, it is meant for a broad audience from, uh, uh, from uh, researchers to uh, practitioners who are all interested in open data and they want to learn more. You know, this whole open day, open uh, go down action curriculum is a very good way for them to, uh, to, uh, to learn this. And go down action colleagues have also provided this as a MOOC program. You know, they ran several MOOC uh, 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 instances of this program uh, over the course of the, uh, uh, of the of the project and in fact what I understand is all these uh, around more than 4,500 uh, participants from 148 countries have taken part in the MOOC program so it's a huge success and we are very grateful for for good and action to uh, for making this uh, excellent capacity development activities uh, for good and and uh, I want to show some of the resources. There are, if you go to the, go, go, the Godan Capacity Development website, you'll find all these resources. But I wanted to highlight some of the resources. Uh, this is thanks to the Open Source Geospatial Foundation. Uh, because what, what we found as, uh, was that, especially in agriculture, you know, you have uh, to use uh, a lot of geospatial information from weather data to land data. So geospatial tools are very important. Unfortunately, many of these tools are very expensive and proprietary. So many of the colleagues in developing countries, you know, they don't have the uh, financial resources to buy the software. So 
so the proprietary software. So it is very important to for them to make also have access to this uh, software. So uh, this that is what uh, that is why you know the resources like OSGO Live is very important because uh, these help uh, provide all the free and open uh, geospatial tools and open data as well for uh, universities uh, and uh, 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 government organizations in the developing world also to uh, in the agriculture departments uh, to learn it. And this, this has been a very uh, useful tool for us to help expand our capacity development activities globally, especially in the developing world. So uh, if you are interested in to learn more about this, you know, if you search for OSG Live or go to our website and uh, you can, you'll find the links to it. Uh, it's a, and there is a lot of tutorials as well for those of you who are new to geospatial uh, science. You know, you can will be able to download a lot of desktop applications uh, from uh, to you know from QGIS uh, to, uh, for example, if you are uh, using web mapping application, all these free, all these uh, resources are freely available, and uh, the tutorials are also there. So uh, you can also make use of them. So we want to make sure you know uh, from the earlier. Uh, one of the key lessons that we learned from the think tank that we organized was, you know, what's what's the point of all, having all these data if if the users don't have access to the tools or they have to pay huge amounts to get access. So we want to reduce that barrier. We want to lower the barriers for uh, for the for the uh, reduce the digital divide, and that's why you know we are uh, wholly committed to providing these resources to uh, to, to the developing uh, to colleagues in the developing world so that they can also learn and make use of these resources. So our capacity building methods, uh, we, you know, we use a lot of different uh, approaches for our capacity development. So we run face-to-face tra -face training uh, training workshops, you know, we have run hands-on workshops in uh, different uh, domains and uh, some of them are blended training trainings um, as well. Some of the examples from uh, Godan Action is a really good example of this. There are online courses that I mentioned before and, uh, you know, there are, we also uh, bring together people in different conferences. We run run think tanks to help us understand the needs of the user communities. Uh, as I mentioned before, workshops as well, and webinars we found as a very excellent medium to reach out to a wider audience as well. So, uh, you know, so we, we are very grateful for RDA to help give us this opportunity to share uh, today some of the work we are doing. But within Godan, we have a Godan webinar series that has been run thanks to colleagues from the CTA, uh, which has been running for the last Two years, uh, so I will show you some examples. You know, and you can. Uh, it's all recorded, and we, uh, those who want to learn more on the different aspects, you know, you will be able to find the recordings and uh, uh, and and watch it later as well. And as Fortini mentioned, you know, there is also the work going on on developing course of contact as well. So the webinar series uh, of Godan, if you go to our website, you'll find this. So this is a great way for us, us to uh, invite experts from different domains to share their work with the wider audience. So uh, you know, uh, each uh, uh, you know, uh, each month mostly we will have a webinar specifically focused on uh, a specific topic, and this will be uh, you know from different domains, from weather data to nutrition data to land data to uh, you know specific examples of uh, some of the Godan outputs. For example, one of the examples on the agriculture open data packages, you know, so so these webinars help in a very sh small, short time, you know, in a 45 minutes presentation, you know, c covers what the, uh, the overview of, uh, you know, that particular topic. So I would recommend you to go to the Godan website and uh, if you're interested, you know, look through the webinars, already uh, available webinar series recordings, if you want to learn more on some of the uh, excellent work done by colleagues around the world as well. As I mentioned before, the Godan Action Curriculum uh, is a very good way for those of you who are new to uh, open data in agriculture to uh, get get to learn about this and to also make use of open data as well. So uh, these five units and the full curricula is available in our website, so you can go there. And there are also a lot of uh, tutorials, a lot of uh, uh, sample materials, uh, like uh, so you know you can learn at your own pace. So the you know, so if you you can if you we should learn if you wish to start learning it, you know these these resources are available to you, and uh, the links are also provided in the in our website as well. So I want to start uh, sharing with you some of the potential solutions that we think uh, you know help us in our capacity development efforts. Uh, so what we found was, you know, agriculture science need open curricula focused on open data for expanding the societal impact of agriculture research and in fact you know we have been following the open science principles so you know so that's why 
We are for Godan, you know, it's not really open data. We are moving into open science uh, in a big way to make sure, you know, the uh, the open data is being, so for example, you know, we want to know you know, the, the, it's not only making open data available, but the, to make sure it's the, we have a purpose to make sure it, it, it eventually helps us uh, achieve our aim of zero hunger. So we need to make sure the uh, practitioners and the governments uh, in the developing world have, have also the, uh, not only the open data, but also the tools to make use of them. And we, we explore the best practices, platforms, and sustainability options as well to develop proposals for training programs for both blended and distance learning. Uh, as part of our efforts for widening the societal impact of agriculture research. And it's very important to, ne uh, to note that there's a big need for multidisciplinary inputs, you know, because Godan, we work from, uh, you know, from uh, satellite data to genomes. So it's a very, very multidisciplinary area. So we work with domain experts from all different uh, thematics, you know, from, uh, you know, plant science colleagues to, you know, computer scientists to, uh, you know, economists, you know, so all these uh, different domain colleagues work together uh, because it's a very wholly multidisciplinary kind of area and we uh, try to bring together uh, this multidisciplinary expertise to help us uh, build up these uh, processes for the future as well. And it's very important to have also an engagement of, of different stakeholders and an open dialogue. So, you know, that's where farmers organizations to governments to uh, industry to uh, to universities, you know, all if you, if you look at our good and partners, we have over 1000 partners and it's all from different uh, different uh, stakeholder communities. So some, uh, many are governments, a lot of them are government organization, but there are a lot of universities and academia, for, you know, and uh, industries and SMEs and startups. And so all of, you know, so what we want to make sure is there's an open dialogue and uh, uh, happening to help us get ideas from different perspectives as well. And the training programs and platforms uh, that we use have to be focused on reducing digital divides, not creating uh, like digital feudalism. So that's why we are, we, are, we want to make sure, you know, for our capacity developing programs, you know, we use uh, free and open uh, uh, tools as well, you know, in addition to open data to help reduce that digital divide. So everybody can make use of it and learn and be part of the digital economy opportunities. And obviously and there's a need for ethical frameworks, uh, course of contact, and uh, as Fortini mentioned, there is a, uh, 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 working group on that. So if you are interested, you know, we would welcome you to join that and, uh, you know, provide your ideas on this as well. So the potential solutions, you know, as I mentioned before, you know, it is uh, important to have this partnership uh, at different levels from uh, the local level to the regional level to the global level for helping us expand impact for open data and agriculture. So for example, you know, one example, for example, I can tell you from Africa, Give, for example, from Africa, you know, we work with universities and uh, in the local level, but then in the regional level, you know, we, we work with organizations like the uh, uh, the Roof Forum, which is the uh, which is like a network of universities across Africa, around 105 universities across Africa who are working in agriculture. So that is kind of the regional kind of focus. So, and then at the global level, you know, we we have the you know, global initiatives as well. So we want to make sure at all, all levels you know, we are engaged and we are able to contribute uh, activities at that appropriate level as well. So that's why, you know, irrespective of you are from the local level to regional level to global level, if you are working in agriculture open data, feel free to reach out to us and join Godan and be part of the wider community as well. And we welcome ideas to share success stories and examples. So for example, if you are doing some uh, interesting work in open data in agriculture, you know, we will be very interested to hear from you and to learn about your work because the whole idea for us is about peer learning you know in fact i will welcome all of you to join our capacity development working group you know it's free and open to all if you go to a website and if you just uh, put uh, there's a join uh, button and if you can put your uh, details in you know you'll be uh, subscribed to a mailing list and it's fr fully free and open and the whole idea of this uh, uh, this working group is to uh, for peer learning so we want we learn from e uh, different uh, colleagues experiences so if you are from different countries, you know, you know, you please share your experiences on how you have been using open data in your particular, uh, in agriculture and how you, uh, you know, what, what was the lessons learned and, you know, what, what are the challenges you are facing or how, what, what help you need, all these things, you know, you are able to, uh, you know, share with your colleagues around the world. And again, capacity development and sharing peer knowledge is very important uh, for, for help us get uh, for the future as well. So that's some of the areas, you know, we hope some of the, Frameworks we build uh, are also important. 
uh, again, so I want to mention that you know it's, we, are, we are a global community and we welcome uh, ideas from everyone from all aspects to help and uh, share ideas with uh, everyone. So you know, all of you are welcome to join the Godan and uh, be part of our community. So how to get involved, you know, so th this will help you uh, find the links of how to get involved. So I we put the links of the various working groups that you might be interested in, uh, the capacity development working group, the data rights and responsible data working group, and the subgroups on code of contact. So, uh, you know, feel free to uh, uh, join this list and as well as email myself and Fotini, and we'll be happy to uh, guide you and we will be happy to respond to your queries as well. So if, uh, I want to again, Thank everyone for joining today's webinar and it has been a great pleasure to share some of this uh, work that we have been doing with the wider community. And uh, I will now uh, like to hand over to for questions and answers. So please feel free to ask questions and we'll be here to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so very much, uh, Sochith and Fotini. Uh, I would like to open up the floor to questions, and I'll ask you to type your questions into the chat window, and we'll make sure that they get heard. There was a, a question from Lanika that I think is directed at perhaps both speakers. Could blockchain technology be helpful to enable smallholder farmers to safely store and share their data? Do you have any comments? Thank you very much. That's a very interesting question. In fact, uh, I am aware that, for example, our colleagues in CTA are working in this area. Uh, so, in fact, there was a webinar specifically on this, and I am more than happy to connect you with the right people in CTA who will be able to get you. And they are doing some work in Africa specifically, so, uh, you know, in blockchain and agriculture data. So, I will be more than happy to uh, share that uh, links with you. And uh, so, please feel free to email me, and I'll, I'll be able to share that information, and they will be able to uh, sh uh, share you with you the uh, ex the examples that they have been doing in CTA. Uh, Can you say again the name of the organization, and I'll put it in the chat. Uh, Cynthia, so, Chief, what was the name again? Okay. Go ahead, Putini. Yeah, just to, um, a quick uh, comment to the previous uh, question about um, uh, blockchain. Uh, uh, it is a good tool for, um, let's say, securing um, transparency and uh, traceability. Uh, so it's it's a, it's I would say it's a good uh, tool, and like Suhit mentioned, CTA is working on that. And from the legal aspect, um, there is a, a good um, uh, EU uh, study uh, about blockchain and uh, the GDPR, how these two can interact in one another. So I will uh, uh, advise you to uh, look at it also as well. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, looks like we have another question from Harris Papagianicus. Although not fully within the concept of our focus, what kind of motives are there for companies and research institutes to develop open data strategies, and how does that affect their business model? Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Harris, for this question. So I think this is a really interesting question. In fact, if you look at uh, uh, you know some of the good and partners, many of them are from the industry as well, and many of them you know make use of open data, you know uh, open data available, but also they release open data as well. So in a way, you know, because by for example, the best example is you know for example. You know, if you have uh, companies who are, you know, for, for example, the traceability, the, now there is a lot of legislation on trying to make sure the sources of, of uh, are traceable as well. So there is a lot of work being done in the, this area as well. And I am more than happy to look into some of the exam success. There are, if, if you go to Godan success stories, you know, there are some examples of, uh, you know, smallholder, uh, uh, small businesses as well as big businesses, you know, making use of open data and making available open data in agriculture and nutrition. So. You know, those success stories will be able to help you understand more. 
So Chief, if I could ask you, uh, when you get a chance, could you put a link to those success stories in the chat? Because I was going to ask about that. Um, here at the National Ag Library, we're working so on a me, tool that could be used. Uh, we're working on a tool that could yep, be I used to gather semi-structured stories about impact. And so we're looking for examples of stories just to make sure that we handle them well. Uh, we, we'd actually like to build a dashboard yes, that I will, I will, uh, I'll helps to. OK, great. Thanks. Um, and I want, just want to thank so the, uh, who question. sent that, uh, the blog to the print. OK. Uh, thank you to Didier for putting the, the link to the blockchain uh, from Thank CTA. Um, we did have another question about open science principles. Uh, would either of you like to answer that or put a link in the chat? Yes, in fact, I will be, able, actually, uh, I'll be able to send. Uh, because I did have... Yes, uh, so the idea, the, the whole, uh, there's a, the, uh, there are two good documents on open science, which I will recommend. One is developed by the European Commission. They have this uh, open science. Uh, I, I will send the URLs of all these uh, later as well, uh, which is a really good way for uh, folks who are in the research world to know about the open science. So open science is not only about, uh, it's a more about how do you make your research uh, more transparent, you know, research reproducibility, and uh, all these aspects of uh, science as well. But it's also from, uh, from, from a capacity development perspective, you know, the, it's also how we, how we make science more inclusive, you know. So for me, uh, you know, it's how, how to make science more inclusive is also very important. So, for example, you know, the, uh, the issues on uh, developing countries, uh, you know, and economically poor uh, universities and people, students not be able to access the digital economy is one aspect, uh, you know, I am now working on and especially trying to make sure these resources are available for everyone. So, you know, so the, uh, so the examples I'm, uh, the, uh, the, the, Key themes I mentioned before, you know, it's uh, the open data is one small aspect of the whole uh, open science. You know, so if you want open science, you need to think holistically. You need to have open, open, uh, open data, but also uh, open tools. You know, free and open software, uh, open standards to make sure the interoperability is uh, maintained, and then open access to research publications, open educational resources. You know, all these combined, you know, has this big uh, effect to help. You know, make sure the knowledge is uh, uh, available for everyone. And I will be sharing some of the so links uh, by on, uh, email as well. Yep, let's go on. Great. Thank you. If I can add to that, I think there's also discussion, and I would be interested in uh, anybody in the chat responding. There's been talk about making data management plans open. So usually mm -hmm. for researchers yep. doing science, proposals are held private to give yep. uh, folks a chance to actually do the research without other people uh, necessarily knowing all of the plans. But at least data management plans have been suggested as worth making public as soon as possible so that people know where the data might actually be going once it's made available. Yes, yes that's a good point. Thank you, Cindy. Um, Fotini, I had a, a specific question that's related to research and the codes of conduct that you were talking about. So you mentioned that the, the three codes of conduct are primarily aimed at businesses, and you had suggested uh, what needed to be done to address uh, farmers as targets of these codes of contact. Is there anything that you think might uh, be valuable to add or change from the perspective of the researchers who might be wanting to work with farmer data and farmers? Is there anything special about research, or are these codes of conduct already in good shape for research use? Uh, well, I would say that uh, there is always place for uh, ameliorating uh, uh, things. The basic thing uh, about researchers and um, uh, about farmers' concerns is that uh, most of the times uh, farmers don't really get back uh, the the benefit of um, a researcher um, study or whatsoever. So uh, it would be good if there would be a focal point 
uh, to, how can I say, bridge this gap between the collection of data and then uh, the distribution of uh, data back to, to farmers. Um, we have also the researcher's perspective. I could share it with you with what are uh, their basic points concerning codes of conduct. I could do that. Uh, and uh, also, um, taking this opportunity, I would like to mention that um, within the next week, uh, it's going to be published the review that we did uh, uh, on uh, these existing codes of conduct with recommendations from the farmer's um, uh, perspective. Uh, so next week, we will be able to publish it by CTA, Godden, uh, GFAR, and uh, the Griffith uh, Law School. Uh, in Australia. Uh, so um, basically it won't be so much around uh, the researchers' point of view as mentioned, but I could share uh, the relevant blog post that we did uh, to showcase what are the researchers' uh, perspective and um, what can be done extra uh, on this field. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we have a question from Nestor asking if it's possible for a country member to ask Godan for workshops at the country level. Do you mean to, uh, to, to do um, a workshop there in their country? I think that's what they're asking. Is it correct? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think so, yes. And uh, Suhif so uh, probably could uh, uh, verify uh, this. But as far as I know, I think yes. Um, okay. If it, there is a concept note specific um, around the topic of the workshop, yes. Okay, thank you. So, Chief, we can't hear you if you're trying to speak, so uh, apologies, you might need to type your answers. Um, we do have a question also from Monday about data verification and what a scientist can do. And I'm not exactly sure, I, I think, does this have to do with quality control on the data? Um, and it, it limits uh, what research can be done in the developing world. Any thoughts on uh, data verification? Or Monday, can you clarify what you mean by your question? For some reason, my, my I don't know why my microphone. Uh, we did hear you, Suchit, so try again. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Oh, great. Yes. Well, thank you. Uh, I, so yes, what was the question again? Because uh, my audio was. So there's a question so, about yeah. so data verification as a problem. Okay, what kind of side I have faced is a limited uh, and has limited. So uh, Monday, do you mean that uh, you you have difficulty accessing the data or the tools to make use of the data? Can you uh, clarify? So you know, is it is it that you know you didn't have the uh, data or uh, once you got the data, you didn't have the tools to verify it and. Again, that's a really interesting question because, again, you know, that comes to the whole idea of open science. You know, if you have some tools which are uh, closed source and you don't have, you are not able to cross-check, uh, you know, the uh, cross-check the, uh, the validity of that particular method they have used, then as a scientist, it's a problem. Science is always about transparency and to make sure, you know, you are able to reproduce results. And that's why, you know, I will definitely uh, recommend you to go through the uh, European Commission's open science uh, policy. You know, this is a really great way to help uh, us all, all of us uh, who are working in science understand the need for, uh, you know, to make our results, uh, not only having the data, but the results of how you do the data, the processing methods are also transparent, you know, so the source code has to be made available. So, some, so you know, when, you're, when they are doing the peer review, you know, the, uh, anyone else should be, can be, uh, can check the methods you have put in your paper. And there are so, some really good examples, uh, you know, that's happening around the world, uh, you know, from the funding agencies to help push this, you know, not only in the 
uh, from the European Union, but uh, the National Science Foundation, they have uh, have a good paper on uh, reproducibility and uh, uh, on scientific results. So I will, I'm more than happy to share the resources, the links of the resources with anyone interested. And uh, Monday, I'm happy, Monday, Adisa, I will be, I, I will, if you send an email to me, I will share those uh, those uh, links to you and every, anyone who is interested. All right, thank you. We are almost at the end of our hour, so I'll leave it open for another minute or two if anybody has additional questions. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I will give a big thank you to both of our speakers and also to Cristiano for handling the logistics of this webinar and uh, to Emma Subarat and uh, uh, others at the FAO who've been helping to facilitate this webinar series. So thank you everyone so for thank attending you very much, and yeah, uh, we'll leave the chat. Good. Sure. We'll and leave the chat open a little longer Cynthia. if people want to. And you know, I want to thank. Yep, we are available. Thank you, Cynthia and everyone for the invitation. Sure. My pleasure. And again, if any of you are interested in speaking in the webinar series, please reach out to us and uh, we'll see if we can get you on the schedule. Also, uh, please keep your eyes open. We will be sending out a survey uh, in the next few days regarding the next EGAD meeting, which we are hoping to schedule for next spring. And the survey will uh, ask information about location, preference, and whether you would like to speak. So please watch your email if you're a member of EGAD. Uh, if you're not a member of EGAD, please go to the Research Data Alliance page and join up, and uh, we will hope to see you at a meeting or another webinar sometime. There's lots of links now going up in the chat. I really appreciate all the uh, shared information. And Christiana also is requesting that people join the aims.fao.org uh, list as well. There's uh, some overlap, but not complete overlap. So uh, we want to make sure everybody gets access to all the information. So with that, I think we will say goodbye. And thanks to everyone for joining. Until next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.